Well, hello, this is Vincent Green, and we're going to continue our study in the book of Isaiah. We're in Isaiah chapter 1. We're looking at this sermon. There's three parts to it. It's a sermon on condemnation to the nation of Judah because of their sin. They're rebellious at heart, verse 2 to 9. They, they will be condemned for their unfaithfulness, which is verse 21 to 31. That's how they manifest their rebellious heart. But in the middle, we've been looking at this section in verse 10 to verse 20, about their empty religion. This is them trying to cover up their sin, trying to hide it from God and hide it from others. When in fact, they may hide, be able to hide it from others. They can even hide it from themselves, be self-deceived into thinking that they're okay with God by following the ritual system that their leaders, their priests have endorsed. But the reality is God sees them clearly. God sees everything about them. He sees their heart. He sees where they're at spiritually, and they are on the path to judgment. It's so clear. Let me read to you these verses, verse 10 to 20. I like to do that each time. And we're going to pick up starting in verse 18 today. Um, we're going to be working through verse 18, 19, and 20 over the next probably four sessions. And we're going to begin that process today. Listen to the Lord, you leaders of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, people of Gomorrah. What makes you think I want all your sacrifices, says the Lord? I am sick of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened cattle. I get no pleasure from the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to worship me, who asks you to parade through my courts with all your ceremony? Stop bringing me your meaningless gifts. The incense of your offerings disgusts me. As for your celebrations of the new moon and the Sabbath and your special days for fasting, they are all sinful and false. I want no more of your pious meetings. I hate your new moon celebrations and your annual festivals. They are a burden to me. I cannot stand them. When you lift up your hands in prayer, I will not look. Though you offer many prayers, I will not listen. For your hands are covered with the blood of innocent victims. Wash yourselves and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Help the oppressed. Defend the cause of orphans. Fight for the rights of widows. Come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. If you will only obey me, you will have plenty to eat. But if you turn away and refuse to listen, you will be devoured by the sword of your enemies. I, the Lord, have spoken. We've seen here from verse 11 to verse 15, God calls upon the leaders of Sodom. That would be a reference to the priests, to the priests being like the leaders that were in Sodom who cared nothing for God who did not revere God, revere God's word, revere God's truth, lived according to their own sinful, rebellious heart. And the people that follow, followed them, they are being addressed by God because God is telling them, I hate your empty religion. He expressed it in seven definitive ways from verse 11 to verse 15. And the result of that is they need to respond to God. They need to respond to God in repentance, verse 16, and faith, turning from sin and turning to God. Repentance is described in verse 16. We've seen that in detail. Faith is described in verse 17 in the five statements that are there. We've seen that in detail. And so now comes these last three verses in this section of this sermon, and it's the concept of acknowledgement. Acknowledgement. See, if they truly understand repentance, and they truly understand what it means to have faith, then they need to 
act on the thing. They need to respond. They need to actually cross the line and acknowledge God. Acknowledge God's truth. Acknowledge God's word. Acknowledge that everything God has said is true. They need to acknowledge all of it. Sadly, I don't know if they will. But these are the words that are being spoken to them. These are being the words that that God is having Isaiah speak. And and the more you read this sermon, I mean, it started in verse 2, going all the way down to verse 31. There are so many word plays. There's so many figurative expressions. I don't think Isaiah could have come up with this on his own. This is definitely the Lord speaking through him, addressing the people in a very definitive, precise way way. And when you analyze what is being said here, it really, it, it's just, it, it's, it just bursts forth with expositional understanding of what God is trying to tell them. You, you feel it in the same way when, when you go into Luke 4 and you see Jesus walk into the synagogue. He opens up the scroll. He reads a few, basically a verse and a half. He reads a few phrases, and when you analyze those phrases, they are a quotation. He's quoting the Old Testament, but he's quoting Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and half, that first half of verse 2. And it's interesting that he stops where he stops. So when you analyze all the different phrases, and we'll eventually get there and do that, then Jesus is, when he says those words, he's implying all the meaning that go along with that. And, and, and sadly, the people don't get it. The people don't get it. It's profound. And that's what we're learning here, is that what you have here is he's described what it means to repent. He's, gonna, he's described what it means to have faith. Now they need to cross the line and acknowledge it all. Here's where action needs to take place. Even though each of the phrases in verse 16 and 17 are exhortations, here in verse 18 to 20, he paints it in a picture of kind of summarizing it all together. Are you really going to repent and have faith? Are you really going to do this? He's calling for them to consider their ways. He's calling for them to to see the road that they're on. This is the same as every godly preacher should do is exhort the people to see their sinfulness and respond to God. This is what Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount. This is what he does in the Sermon on the Plain. This is what the apostles will do. This is what Peter does in Acts chapter 2. Calls for people to repent. This is very clear. They need to understand the truth. They need to understand godliness. They need to understand righteousness. So in verse 18 to 20, let me give you the structure of how this lays out. And then it's going to take this session and the next three to to go through all of this because I want you to understand it. Um, But the first phrase, come now, let us settle this, which, by the way, verse 18, 19, 20 is a very popular passage. These three verses are normally quoted by pastors in gospel context, right? In gospel proclamations. These are three verses that deal with that or pastors use for that, and rightly so. This is the heart of the gospel message. You now know what faith, repentance and faith is, what they are. Now act upon it. You need to go through the process. You need to do this. So here's how this breaks down. In, in verse 18, the very first statement, come now, let's settle this. That is a statement that says, says the Lord, which you see that phrase show up throughout this sermon. Um, verse 11, previously up in verse 11, you'll see it in verse 2. Uh, you'll also see it again at the end of verse 20. So th- this statement comes up. This just reminds you that it's God, the covenant God, the almighty God that he is speaking. These are his words. He's addressing the people. And yes, Isaiah's the one 
opening his mouth and saying these words, but they're coming directly from God through Isaiah to the people. It is as though God is speaking. It's the dynamic of God's word. It's the dynamic that God gave us a book that we can read and study and analyze and understand and act upon, and we can believe it. And and Jesus and, and our Lord tells us the truth. He always has. He always will. And this is the truth. So the first phrase, come now, let's settle this, is God's call, is God's um, ringing the bell, telling the people that they need to act upon what they are being told. It's a call to action is what it is. And so that's what we're going to look at in detail today, that statement, because you need, you need to understand what that means. But in summary, it's a call to action. But then when you get to the, uh, the latter part of verse 18, going all the way through verse 20, it is the rationale for calling them to action. It's the reason why God calls them to action. And there's two basic reasons. In verse 18, or the latter part of verse 18, there's two reasons. They are to acknowledge, okay? He's calling them to acknowledge the sovereign rule of God. And, and, and the rationale for God calling them to come to him and let's settle this, let me help you to understand the reality This is where you get into truth and reality, as we noticed in uh, the middle part of verse 17. Here's God expressing reality. Here it is. You need to acknowledge him because, number one, God is the only one who can cleanse you from your sin. You cannot, in in doing what you're doing, you cannot cleanse yourself from your sin. There is no way, no, no power. And secondly, and this is verse 19 and 20, only God can judge a person because of sin. That gets back to the accountability issue. See, God is the only one who can be Savior. A God is the one whom you are accountable to. There's no way around it. No way around it. It is God. God and Him only. And this is what they have to acknowledge. And see, it, you, nobody's going to acknowledge that if they want to remain in their sin. If they want to live an independent life, if they want to believe in their hearts that they are righteous on their own, they don't need God, they don't want God, they don't even want to believe there is a God to even be accountable to. They have to realize they're fighting against the Lord of the universe, the true God of heaven. This is reality. This is reality. And so it breaks down that way. The first phrase is the, is the call to exhortation, or the call to acknowledge. It's the exhortation call, if you want to call it that, if you want to define it that way. It is, it's, the, it's the exhortation to you need, you must acknowledge me. You must acknowledge your sin. You must acknowledge the the picture that I have painted for you. You must acknowledge what I have told you, that it is true. Why? Because I'm the only one that can cleanse you from your sin. I'm the only one that can take sin away. And you are ultimately accountable to me. Pretty good reasons. (laughs) That should convince anybody. You can't make it any clearer than this. So let's begin to look at this. Come now, let's settle this. That is an imperative as the or an exhortation. That's, an, that's a command, just as they are in verse 16 and 17. This is God, like I said, 
This is God speaking here. The verb come now. So there's two parts to this phrase. Come now, let's settle this. Part one, part two. Let's look at them in those in the light of that. So come now is a verb that's used to introduce a proposition which is intended to benefit the one whom is being addressed. Sometimes the word can be used or the command can be used to benefit both parties. But in, in this case, what you see is that God's not in the wrong here. It's the people. They are in the wrong. When God is saying, come now, he's inviting them. It's, it's, it's not really, you know, boom, I'm hammering you. It's really inviting. That's why this, this phrase is used or this statement is used or quoted by preachers at, at a gospel invitation. This is actually a positive thing here. It's, it's said in such a way, the wording is used in such a way as to bring people closer to God for them to deal with this, the problem that he has addressed. In other words, God so loves them, so cares for them, but he knows where they're headed he knows that they're, they're, that they're blinded and walking towards a cliff and that they're going to fall off. So this is, a, this is God's evangelistic cry to wake them up, to, 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 to have them see that they're going towards judgment, that they're going towards that which is everlasting fire. That's just the reality of it. And he's saying, come now, come to me. This is a command which cannot, should not be evaded. It must be obeyed. It's an urgent, there's an urgency here. There's an urgent call, there's an urgent cry, there's an urgent plea. And see, God alone is going to lay down the conditions which must be followed by these people. God is God. And when God's calling them to come now, this is not, well, let's have a meeting of equals. They're not equals. God is God. God is high and holy and lifted up. He is majestic. He is supreme. He is the sovereign one of the universe. He is perfect in every way. He is the perfect, sinless God, but we're sinful people. This is not a meeting of equals. It's not that kind of statement. And he says, come now. That's where the urgency comes in. But it's a loving invitation it is exhortation. It is an imperative. It is a command. There is urgency to it, but there's love and grace mixed in with it. This is not, come here now, I'm going to beat you up. No. This is, come to me. Come to me. We need, I need you to understand something. I need you to see something. I need you to realize something. It, Jesus would use the same kind of language in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, when Jesus would say, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You see the more sin the more energy you expel. And he's using this figurative type language. The way Jesus talks here is what you find in the Old Testament. It's the same kind of language. He says, my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. <laughs> Remember uh, back in Isaiah, uh, earlier in the chapter, uh, it says in verse 4, they're a sinful nation. They're loaded down with a burden of guilt. You see, guilt adds a burden. 
And, and what God is doing is he's inviting them. Yes, it's urgent, but he's inviting them to see that they <coughs> can be set free from their sin. That the bondage of sin it can be released. They can be released from it. Here are some other passages that, that speak in similar ways. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20 to 23, wisdom shouts in the streets. She cries out in the public square. She calls to the crowds along the main street, to those gathered in front of the city gate. And so what does wisdom say? How long, you simpletons, will you insist on being simple-minded? How long will you mockers relish your mocking? How long will you fools hate knowledge? Come and listen to my counsel. I'll share my heart with you and make you wise. You see, it's more like more expressive, very similar to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11. It's the same kind of language that's inherent in the statement being made here about come now. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of, the, of wicked people. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. Turn, turn from your wickedness, O people of Israel. Why should you die? You see the pleading? You see the invitation? You see the urgency? There it is, another expression of it. Micah chapter 6. Stand up and state your case against me. Let the mountains and the hills be called to witness your complaints. And now, O mountains, listen to the Lord's complaint. He has a case against his people. He will bring charges against Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? What have I done to make you tired of me? I want you to answer me. I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from slavery. I sent Moses and Aaron and Miriam to help you. Don't you remember? My people, how King Balak of Moab tried to have you cursed, and how Balaam, son of Beor, blessed you instead. Don't you remember that? And remember your journey from Archaea Grove to Gilgal, when I, the Lord, did everything I could to teach you about my faithfulness. So what can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring him burnt offerings? Should we bow before God most high with offerings of yearly calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? Is that what we should do? This is verse six and seven there is the response of the people. It says though God is pleading with the people and the people are saying, well, what do you want? You want sacrifices? You want burnt offerings? You want a plethora of them? We'll bring them to you. It's, you see the same kind of thing being said here. Actually, Micah is a contemporary of Isaiah. They're both preaching to the same group of people. And the answer comes back. No, O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you to do what is right to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. There you go. So come now. There's the exhortation. But then you have the next part. Let's settle this. <laughs> yeah, it's... You think you, the image you can have in your head is that, okay, uh, come, let's, let's deal with this. Come on. But there's still no harsh tone here. But it is urgent. There's something that has to be dealt with. This, again, both statements, when you put them together, this is the urgency of the gospel call. This is the urgency of the gospel message. This, this is classic language. This is really interesting language. The way this is put, the way this is stated. The way this is normally translated is let us reason together. 
So there contains in the idea of this, in this statement, let's settle this, let's reason together, it's the idea of reciprocity, meaning the exchanging of, or the process of exchanging things, exchanging ideas. This is the exchange that's in mind, though. It, this is not like, okay, people, you come. I'm going to convince you. Um, I you want to use my logic and my convincing. Now, God has all the logic. He created logic. But we're going to reason together as neutral parties, and you're going to, you know, you're going to give me your rationale for why you are still holy in my sight, even though you live the way you do. That's not what this is, okay? Remember, these are not equal parties. So what kind of reciprocity or the process of exchanging things, what is the inherent meaning here? Here's what it is. God gives to us something, and we give something back to Him. Okay, let me say that again. God gives us something, and we give something back to Him. This is how it works. God, you know what God gives to us in His sovereignty? He gives us Christ's righteousness. He gives us the righteousness of Himself, of the Messiah. In the Old Testament, they're looking to the Messiah. For us, we're looking back when the death of Christ, and Paul explains this in the book of Romans, that Christ's righteousness is imputed to us so that when God sees us, how can we be in his presence? Because of the righteousness of the Messiah who was perfect, the Son of God who died on a cross, rose again from the dead, saved us from our sins. We are in Christ. In that sense. That's what that means. He is our covering. He is the one who cleanses us. He is the one who saves us. He is the one who transforms us. He is the one we have faith in. What do we give him? Our total allegiance. We submit to him. You see, that's what repentance and faith is. It's us submitting to him fully. You see, when you try to be, when you think that rituals are going to save you, are going to make you right in God's eyes, the religious leaders thought that just by being a Jew by heritage, being a Jew by birth, put them in God's graces, made them right with God. John the Baptist stated that clearly. You think you're safe because of you're just a Jew? Is that where you're going with this? You've misread the entire scriptures of the Old Testament. You don't get it. That's not what Isaiah would affirm. It's not what Jeremiah would affirm. It's not what Moses would affirm. It's not what any of the prophets would affirm. They would actually speak clearly against that. Go back and read Isaiah 1. John the Baptist is stating that very clearly. He's, he's smashing that concept. And so the Jews, they would, they, they would try to think in their head, they would be deceived to think that they are okay with God when in fact they, boy, have they violated the test of loyalty. They have, they have gone against God. They are sinners in their heart. They're not bowing their knee to the Savior. They're not humbling themselves. They're not coming seeing their need for a Savior, seeing that they are spiritually bankrupt, that they're mourning over their sin. They're not repentant at heart. They don't have true faith in God. They, they're trying to cover it up. And the Lord is, you see, the pattern is here in Isaiah. And, and God is saying to them, let's settle this. I give you righteousness. I will change you. I will cleanse you. I will save you. But you must acknowledge me. You must submit your entirety to me. You must bow to me. Give me your heart. Follow me. The grammar here, let us, it's called technically cohortative. It's an invitation to discuss together the accusation which the Lord has made against Israel. It's what I just read about in Micah. 
It's the same kind of thing. You got a complaint against me? Well, I got a complaint against you. And my complaint against you trumps your complaint. <laughs> because I'm God, you're not. I am Lord, you're not. I am the one who made you. You are not, you didn't evolve from some amoeba, some slime, uh, uh, or, or descend from some ape creature. No, I brought you into this world. I created humanity. Genesis 1, you are accountable to me. You need to hear what I say, and we will talk this out, but you better realize that I'm giving you reality. You do not, you did not control the day that you came into this world. It is not in your control the day you leave this world. And when you do leave this world, everything changes for you. See, God has made it so that this is the day of grace for people. He has made it. He's given them time. He says the rain falls on the just and the unjust. He, he gives them health. He gives them, he gives them uh, the ability to eat and live so as, they, so as they may be able to hear His truth, hear His message, and be able to have time to respond to it. He gives them so much grace. But are they willing to submit? And they must hear the accusations that he has against them. They must acknowledge it. They must see that they are a wretch. They must see that they are a wretch and a rebellious wretch at heart. See, the God and the people here, they're not at equal level. There is a clear distinction. And there's only one way to go here. Submit absolutely to God's dictates, which he lays down very clearly. Very clearly. You can go to Isaiah chapter 41, verse 21. You present the case for your idols, says the Lord. Okay, present your case. Let them show what they can do. Let them try to tell us what happened long ago. Can they do that? Let them tell us what the future holds. Can they do that? No. They can't do anything at all. Your idols are not going to help you. Your empty religion is not going to help you. You need to hear what I'm saying. The eyes of your understanding better be, better be open. You can go to Isaiah 43, Acts 17, Acts 18, Acts 24. These same kind of statements of let's settle this. You need to hear clearly the accusation that God has against you because it's a clear accusation. It's a real accusation. And you cannot deny it. The terms here do hint towards that same kind of legal terminology. But this is not the kind of trial in which you can talk back to God and try to negotiate another deal. No, there's no negotiation here. This is not God saying, hey, come, let's negotiate some stuff. Let's try to find another way. No, that, that's not what's being said here. When it says, let's settle this, this is not like, okay, let's just appease the guy and let's just make it go away. No, that's not what this is about. You are going to be judged in light of God's law. And you better acknowledge that in repentance. I've explained to you what repentance is. I've explained to you what faith is. You better acknowledge all of that. You better acknowledge the reality of what my accusation against you. I am perfect. I see you better than you see yourself. God has already made his arguments. That's the point. He's made his arguments. That's what he was doing from verse 11 to verse 15. That's what he was doing really starting back in verse 2. 
It's time for the people, when it says settle this, it means you need to acknowledge what I have said is true, or you better either acknowledge it or you don't. You need to consider your ways. That's another way of looking at this. See, the Lord has said this. You must acknowledge or confess to me the reality of how I have described you in your heart. You are a sinner, lost, on your way to hell, on your way to judgment. God knows it, even though you may not want to believe it. You may think, ah, no, it's just a figment of imagination. No, these are just, this is just like one person told me, the Bible's just a bunch of riddles. Just a book of riddles. He didn't care for it. No, (laughs) this is truth that must be proclaimed and that you are accountable to. Jesus makes an interesting statement in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, that's what we're doing. That's what we're talking about. That's verse 18 to 20, acknowledging. You acknowledge me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. When he talks about acknowledging and denying, does that just mean acknowledging that God exists or saying that God doesn't exist? No, it goes way beyond that. Do you acknowledge that what God has said about you is real, is true? How God has defined you, as God has said clearly in His Word from Genesis to Revelation that you are in sin, that you need a Savior. You need Him to save you. Do you acknowledge that? See, do you believe it's real? Or do you think it's all bunk? How you answer that question is going to result in the destiny of your life. It's just the case. You can deny it every day, every moment of every day. You can think it's a bunch bunch of craziness, a bunch of lunacy, a bunch of lies, and you could even believe or state that That me, the preacher here, is crazy for even preaching this stuff. But this is what the Bible says. We are all sinners on our way to judgment. And God is calling out to you and pleading to you to hear His Word. Hear His truth. What's going to be your answer? All of this is said, this invitation, this is what the Lord says, the covenant God, the almighty God, the one who made heaven and earth, the one who established the covenant with the nation of Israel. He's addressing them, pleading with them for them to come to him. He's got a rationale for doing it because he's going to state truth that they must realize. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you are the true and living God. Lord, your word states truth. There's a heaven and there's a hell. And Lord, even though humanity wants to deny it all, reject you. Your word says it's true. And Lord, you're giving the invitation. You're telling people. You're making sure that people hear very clearly. Lord, 
Or may we never lose sight of the gospel call of the needed exhortation. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to keep working through um, the way these sessions are, these verses. Uh, we've got three sessions left. We're going to look at, uh, I think, latter part of verse 18 next. Um, and then we'll look at verse 19 in a session and then verse 20 in a session. I think this is kind of how it's going to go. So um, we'll work our way through these verses. And once we get through that in the next three sessions, then we'll be completed this second part of Isaiah's sermon. And then we'll go into the next part, verse 21 to verse 31. Tell others about the series. Tell others about the channel. And uh, may the Lord richly bless you today. And we'll see you next time.